Hi everyone um, and uh, good day to all of you. Uh, my name is Aditya and I am a doctoral candidate at the Stanford Graduate School of Education. Um, today I'm going to spend some time talking to you about my research um, at the intersection of virtual reality and virtual learning environments and learning. Um, and the goal really for, uh, for this presentation is for me to try and really give a super quick bird's eye view of what we know and what we do not know about VR and learning. Um, the reality is that, uh, and the goal uh, of this study that we have just conducted or this review that we have just conducted is to really try to demystify um, the ambiguities that exist in the literature and in the findings on what virtual reality and what immersive virtual reality can offer for education. And uh, I've spent the last few um, months working with both my advisors, uh, Professor Roy P. Um, in the Learning Sciences Program and Professor Jeremy Balinson um, in the Communication Department at Stanford to really um, do a complete thorough analysis of all the papers um, that have really tried to explore the learning opportunities of VR and education and try to really demy demystify what we know and what we do not know about um, VR and learning. Um, so yeah, so our objective is to really, uh, what I just said, it is to organize VR media across discrete parameters like degrees of freedom and continuous parameters like immersion, realism, and interactivity. Um, once we organize VR media, because there is a whole spectrum of VR um, uh, that, that exists um, and that has been utilized today and also in the past, uh, we want to then try to demystify the ambiguity in findings on learning with VR in each of these categories and try to identify key areas for future research. Um, the biggest goal for me with this review was to uh, inform an agenda um, or a prioritization um, of how we should be thinking about content creation and how we should be thinking about um, really integrating virtual reality into everyday um, learning um, environments. So, so that's the goal. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, um, there are, of course, many different uh, ways in which we can locate um, this work in the larger narrative of virtual learning environments. The way we did it was we surveyed the literature and the learning sciences that integrated or engaged with a spectrum of VR um, um, environments. Um, these could be desktop based systems, these could be room scale moves, um, which some of you may have heard of and used of, uh, mobile VR, um, these things that work with a smartphone and a Google Cardboard or a cardboard like headset as well as 360 degree content, which is very uh, ubiquitous today with uh, platforms like Google Maps and all these other tools. Um, the way we mapped this was on, on one dimension on the vertical axis, we have interactivity from low to high, which is just the degree of control that the user uh, has. And then we have immersion on the horizontal axis, um, which is just how immersive this experience is. Is it something that happens in a head mounted display or a headset, or is it something that is delivered on a two dimensional surface or a screen? Um, based on this clarification, uh, based on this classification, um, we have desktop VR and caves, um, uh, which uh, are these room scale um, or uh, computer based simulations that have been around for a few decades now um, that are very interactive, but not necessarily immersive because it's not something that is happening, uh, that is blocking out all external stimuli through a head mounted display. Um, if you look to the right side on the top right, mobile VR and 360 falls in this category of being immersive because it's in a headset, but it's not really interactive. If you think about mobile VR, you're largely just looking around and most of the content is static and non-interactive. Um, and the content that we, or the platforms that we believe are immersive and interactive are um, these, these headset, uh, head-mounted displays that are the, these new range of devices that either offer uh, various multiple degrees of freedom uh, of movement on the head that may even come with hand controllers that allow you to do more uh, uh, degrees of freedom and movement with the hand, both left and right hand. Um, these are typically head-mounted displays um, that are either consumer devices like the Oculus or the HTC Vive, um, but these are also have been around for a long time in research. Um, lots of custom devices that uh, will offer uh, translation and rotation um, in uh, at the head as well as at the hands um, through the use of controllers, sometimes even other parts of the body. Um, this is just one of many classifications out there and I'm going to now jump into each of these three categories one at a time to talk about what the research says about learning uh, with platforms or environments um, of this kind. So let's look at immersive VR. And immersive VR, once again, are these uh, head mounted displays, six degrees of freedom, at least um, very immersive and very interactive. Um, you would think that uh, the research would be very clear on this, but it's really surprising because um, the thing is most VR experiences in education um, 
that have been delivered on devices like the Oculus um, have either been accessed or, uh, or these experiences are usually almost always off the shelf consumer products. Very little evidence for any significant pedagogy backed curriculum design work or any research driven content development process. These are, are many popular companies like Lapster and a bunch of others um, have been studied, but most of these are off the shelf consumer uh, products or platforms. Um, the findings on immersive VR delivered through head mounted displays shows conflicting results. This may suggest a disconnect on expertise. And what I mean by that is on one side, some studies show very high knowledge retention and learning, deeper efficacy and increase in confidence. Others show no difference between VR and the control group on a retention test, for example. Um, for example, there was one paper that showed that students have viewed a PowerPoint slideshow performed significantly better on the post-test than the VR group. Um, and uh, students uh, actually reported being more present in the VR condition, but they ended up learning less um, and were experiencing higher cognitive load based on the EEG measures. So these conflicting results that, uh, that, that really exists in this field is, might be related to the fact that almost all research involving VR and education has so far featured learning content which is, uh, in which learning scientists are either using existing off the shelf uh, content or uh, it is featured content that is um, built by educators but are not really built with significant high quality VR. Um, so there's a disconnect where you have these VR developers who are creating um, content with off the shelf devices with very, very little understanding of pedagogy. And then you have the, um, the, the educators who have not been engaging with high end uh, immersive six degrees of freedom, fully immersive VR. Um, the other problem is learning itself has not been clarified. What you mean by retention or procedural uh, knowledge retention. Um, and this is kind of a drawing from the Gilbert Ryle framework of learning how versus learning that, that, um, uh, Prior work does not make an effort to distinguish learning with VR of tasks that involve procedure versus tasks that are declarative. And I believe that uh, if we are able to actually bring some more clarity to this, uh, we might be able to actually see more promising outcomes and findings. And the other thing is because this is such a new field of work, these devices are only very slowly becoming consumer available and accessible. Individual differences are almost entirely not considered um, in prior work. So any question, on uh, individual differences like personality, gender, system one versus system two thinking. It is a novel question that can be explored um, in future work. Desktop virtual environment. So uh, many scholars have been doing this work for many, many decades. Um, Chris DD is one that comes to my mind right away, who's been doing a lot of work with moves and desktop based virtual environments. It's a very evolved field of work. And uh, research shows that these simulations really positively change attitudes, um, like those around health or well being, around learning. Um, some evidence of transfer of skills from the virtual world to the real world, which is also very promising. Um, VR seems to be, or the virtual environments here seem to be triggering intrinsic motion motivation, engagement, joy, they improve confidence and self-efficacy. Um, and most of these studies are long-term, longitudinal interventions that have been integrated into standards, into curriculum. And I would say kind of summarizing everything that I just said, the most important takeaway here is that curriculum design has been performed with these environments because these have been around for a longer amount of time. Um, and it's hard, it's critical, and it's really hard. Um, the pedagogy and learning science theory integration is what pushes the technology beyond the novelty effect. And this is the biggest problem with immersive VR, the previous category, which is it's so new that it's really hard to parse out whether it's due to novelty or newness or whether it's truly due to any sort of learning outcome. Um, Design-based research uh, is a method that has been employed extensively in these studies. Um, uh, and it's really interesting, immersive VR experiments, uh, the previous category are missing longitudinal work, they're missing DVR, and the repetitive use of VR over a period of time in environments. Um, uh, there does exist a large ecosystem of work with desktop VR and a bunch of other virtual environments um, over the last decade that has looked at desktop as has looked at these methods of integrating uh, uh, these, these technologies into the learning environments. And I would say that is the biggest thing that we're missing with the immersive HMD VR, which is why there could be so many conflicting um, findings today. The last category that I want to talk about today is mobile VR. And this is really important um, because um, the research is not very evolved here. Uh, uh, studies are not rigorous. Um, we really do not know what, much about what's happening with mobile VR in the classroom. But there's a ton of hype, a lot of media attention, especially in the early days of mobile VR with platforms like Google Cardboard 
and uh, Google Expeditions. Um, it is by far the most affordable and accessible form of head-mounted display rendered VR today. Um, the problem is it is shown to cause motion sickness and nausea if used for long periods. It can come across as very gimmicky, um, and this is because you're often uh, trying to you have different phone sizes, different other battery constraints, overheating. These devices are not very durable, not very resistant. And imagine bringing that into an average everyday K-12 classroom. It's just not sustainable. And it can cause motion sickness and nausea because the frame rates are not usually that not, not that great. And there's often a lag um, in these devices. But it is still the most widely integrated platform in schools, largely thanks to companies like Google and Google Expeditions. Um, and uh, some exploratory studies that have taken more of an exploratory qualitative approach have been able to demonstrate that inquiry driven learning has been deeply promoted through the use of these platforms. Uh, what they mean by inquiry driven learning is they just tend to describe uh, the presence of a hook or some sort of an initial stimulus that really helps raise curiosity and promote students to ask more questions. And this is what makes mobile VR really compelling. These questions have been measured to be higher order um, and are either analytical, evaluative or inquiring about impact, which is usually uh, a consequence of the students engaging with this uh, static, often almost static, non-interactive, but immersive uh, mobile VR content. Um, 360 content is largely what is delivered on mobile VR platforms. By 360 content, I mean content that is filmed and delivered in 360 degrees all around the user. Uh, and really, we don't know uh, how we can design good quality 360 content. I think this is a big research question for the future, is how do we unpack the underlying set of principles of learning in VR from a, from a design standpoint? Um, um, when we build and make educational experiences in 360. So this is kind of where the field is at. And I thought I'd just have a slide that talks briefly about what it is that we are working on at Stanford um, as, as next steps and what I uh, plan to be doing also as part of my research over the next year. Um, our goal really is to build a VR curriculum in the immersive spectrum. So looking at immersive head-mounted display VR, uh, we want to work uh, at really trying to understand um, how we can uh, integrate these curriculums into an everyday learning environment, um, aligning with standards, and really trying to integrate learning science theory into the design and development of these experiences to move beyond the novelty effect. Um, there is a need for long-term studies, and we are trying to run a long-term longitudinal intervention over the next year, um, really trying to deliver and, and, and understand outcomes um, more deeply. Um, one piece I will say, I mean, really the gold standard for any VR experience is to cause behavior change, and not just stay limited to belief change. And this is, this is something that we really strongly believe in, and I um, thought I should include this um, as I conclude my presentation. And what I, what I mean by this is by virtue of engaging in an immersive experience um, about a topic, the user needs to be driven to think differently and ultimately do something different in their actions in the real world. In other words, the user was given good insights, but also actionable insights. Not only did they feel more empathetic, and there's a lot of empathy studies um, with VR out there, but they also felt like they had causal efficacy to do something differently as a result of that empathy. And this desired outcome might suggest particular properties of the immersive VR experience. And my goal through these studies, through this curriculum design exercise, is to unpack those features of the experience that differentiate between having an effect on belief versus having an effect on behavior. Um, specifically for my uh, my research moving forward, we are actually focusing on environmental education and VR. Um, at Stanford over the last couple of years, uh, we have been developing uh, an entire curriculum called the Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience, um, which really looks at uh, educating you on the dangers of ocean acidity. And we have seen that it can positively influence uh, student behavior, change attitudes and stereotypes towards climate change. And we want to be measuring this um, over the long term by really building a curriculum around this VR experience and integrating it into an everyday learning environment. Um, so that's my time. I would love to stay in touch and connect with, uh, with all of you. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity for me to present my research. Um, and I hope all of you are staying safe and uh, have a wonderful day um, ahead. Thank you.